with Airbnb, it's so much fun because you get to let your creativity run wild. It's a really good strategy for someone that doesn't have property but still wants to push up their cash flow. You're listening to the She Renovates podcast. You're listening to She Renovates, the podcast for women who want to renovate to create an income and a life they love. Hello, hello, everyone. We're back. It's that day in the week. And today I'm going to be talking about 10 things to consider when buying a property for short-term rental or Airbnb, which are the same thing. And I was asked this question recently and I thought that's a really good topic because um, it is different to buying an investment property. And so I'm going to be really going through, you know, important things that you need to think about before you actually buy the property. And just for context, I I was on Airbnb before most people even knew it existed. I would have been 10 years ago. And so, and I have had a lot of properties on Airbnb and um, early in my, in the piece, I was really, um, that was my goal. But in recent years, I've realised that it's not really the smartest way to go and I, I will be sharing why today. The other thing is I lead a community in which we have some very experienced Airbnb hosts and we also have some newbie Airbnb hosts. So I see the whole plethora of, I guess, backgrounds and issues that crop up. And just as a um, note, uh, one of the graduates from our Airbnb program actually is the host of a very popular Airbnb podcast called Hosting with Heart. Okay, so let's get into this. Now, before I start, I want to qualify what short-term rental actually is. And technically, it's any um, term or uh lease that is less than 90 days, less than three months, okay? So once it's over 90 days, then it's no longer considered short-term rental. And that's important when you're looking at legislation. And you're, you know, you might have a property in a building that doesn't allow short-term rental, then you know that you are still able to have some, have a guest for 90 days, uh, which for us has worked really well. Now, the first thing um, you want to think about is location. And so, you know, I, I guess I've seen like three main areas emerge as being good for short-term rental or classifications of areas. Okay, so the first one is the inner city, one better generally. Yeah, so a small property inner city for, you know, like travellers, people that are visiting the city and so on. The next uh, one that I think is also a very strong market is the um, country house, you know. So um, we see a lot of that happening in, um, you know, like areas like Dalesford, um, the Southern Highlands in New South Wales and so on. And, but usually, often they are bigger properties. And then the third area of opportunity that I can see is really rural um, locations. Um, I discovered this by accident, really, when I was renting out a property for my mum and it was a little two-bed unit. It's a few years ago now. And in a place called Rochester, which has got a population of 2,300. And on long-term rent, I would have got $220 a week. And on short-term, I got $700 a week. So it turned out to be a winner. I did some research for my brother recently, who's got a house in a very, very remote town. And we worked out that his return would be around about 50000 a year. And this is in a property that he paid 230000 for. So that doesn't mean that every 
uh, rural area will do really well, but it does mean that you need to investigate. The second point, which is uh, make sure that you do investigate the demand before you start spending money on a property. And so you have an easy way of doing that. It's not comprehensive, but it's a good quick check to go to AirDNA and punch in the address. Pretty sure you can do this without an account. And it'll spit out a guide to how much money you'll make from that property on short-term rental. Now, as I said, it's not definitive because sometimes it's not reliable. Often it will understate the potential of your property and sometimes it overstates it. And that's usually because there's not enough data to, you know, like they're not gathering enough data because there aren't enough properties in the area for you to really know whether there is really demand or not. But it's a good first start place. So the next thing you want to think about is are you going to buy a unit or are you going to buy a house? And um, once again, that depends a lot on where you, where you are and the strategy you're going for. That used to be that um, like it would do really well just about anywhere. That's no longer the case, uh, mainly because there are a lot more hosts on a lot more owners and so you need to be a little bit more strategic. Personally, I prefer smaller properties because I think bigger properties like are uh, way too much work um, in terms of maintenance and keeping them um, in top condition and also you've got bigger cleaning fees, you've got more linen to deal with and so on. I personally think the sweet spots are one better because you can um, accommodate four people. You can have a sofa bed in the, uh, in the living room and you can have a queen or a king bed in the main bedroom. And the majority of your guests will be single or couples. So you're really catering to the majority of the travelling population. Now, the next thing to think about is you want to make sure that you understand the state and the local legislation around short-term rental. Now, I mentioned before that short-term rental is, is 90 days or less. And so, like, in um, Sydney, we have a cap. So you can only have your property on um, short-term rental or Airbnb for 180 days a year, unless, of course, it's part of your home, which is how we manage not to have to worry about that with the factory floor because it is actually part of our home. But that plays into the viability of the property. It is easy to manage that, to manage your, you know, staying on the right side of the law with that, but you want to be aware of it. Some other areas, council areas, require you to get a development application, or I forget the name of it, but to say that you're changing the use of the property and it costs a significant amount of money, up to $10,000. So I guess the long and the short of it is you need to find out from your council and check your staff state laws to check that you what you need to do to comply with the law. There are also um, safety um, laws around that too, around fire safety and so on. And also in New South Wales, you have to register as a short-term rental owner. Okay, so the next point is do you go for new or do you go for existing? So my preference is definitely new. Like we've had put properties on short-term rental prior to renovating, then renovated them and then put them back on afterwards. And it is a hundred times easier um, after the property has been renovated. When all the surfaces are new, it's very easy to keep clean. So I, for that reason, new or newly renovated is definitely my preference. Now, the next point is that you want the property to have some uniqueness. We talk, we call it talk about, it, it needs to be talk aboutable um, because that really helps with your market. And like a lot of older properties, you can do cute retro um, themes, but the reality of the prop is that the property is still not new and um, 
Things like bathrooms, you need to be able to keep them in pristine condition because a gungy bathroom nobody wants. And so, yeah, so if, if I had a preference, I would go for a new apartment or, or a newly renovated house. So think about that. Parking is definitely desirable, particularly in a city, because you're going to, if you make it life difficult for your guests, then that will reflect in your reviews. However, we have um, some of our hosts have um, properties in um, inner city locations that don't have parking. And if the city has good public transport, you can probably get away with it. But generally speaking, I'd say make sure that you've got parking because it just opens up the funnel and you can have more people stay um, because you don't have that sort of buyer objection. Uh, which brings me to the next point, and that is uniqueness. Now, if you were listening to the interview I did with Mary and Lila recently, they mentioned that they like to have properties that have something special. Okay, and that's really important because there's a lot of properties on the listing um, platforms and you want something that's going to stop guests from scrolling. Okay, so um, it might be the view, it might be a theme, um, it might be a gorgeous garden. Um, you might create a selfie uh, wall in your home, but it needs to be something that people are going to talk about. We have a few of our women that have bought historic properties to um, to renovate for short-term rental, and that's a really great idea because you can really build on the history of the property and um, take people back in time. So let's talk about management. So management costs around, if you want to have someone else manage your, your short-term rental, it costs around 20% of your income plus GST. Sometimes it can get a bit lower, uh, which you don't really have a lot of choice if you uh, if the property is not near you. However, my preference would always be to manage myself, but to have an on-site cleaner. Okay, so pay your cleaner a bit more because you're saving money on the management. So that person takes responsibility, some ownership over the property but really much better if you can manage yourself. Because one of the problems with um, properties under management is that you don't have any control over, you know, what happens, like getting reviews is hard because if they're not prompting your guests to, um, to write a review, then it's, you know, it's, it's hard for your uh, property to get momentum. Yeah, so if you can manage that side of it, it makes it so much easier because reviews are the lifeblood of your listing. So around uh, management and reviews, um, you want to get reviews as quickly as possible, particularly if you don't have a profile. If you're not a super host, um, it takes around about four reviews to get um, to get any sort of traction, but then the next thing you want to do is get to Superhost. In terms of setting it up, I would really strongly recommend that you set the home up as economically as you can because things get damaged, okay, and so um, and that's just through normal wear and tear. It's not really um, malicious damage but you just want to try and um, keep the cost down because you'll be changing it over fairly regularly. So um, I would definitely watch Marketplace and Gumtree for good buys so that you, um, yeah, so that you keep your um, outlay to a minimum. I've actually um, styled a property for about $1,000 doing it that way. Um, it does make us take a serious commitment to do it. I think where a lot of the cost comes in is the linen, okay? So if you can manage to find a linen service, you're way better off because um, having beautiful linen is really important. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Um, 
And so, yeah, don't put really precious things in the home because if they do get damaged, you know, it, it, it needn't be intentional, but you just don't want that heartbreak. So be careful about that. Um, remember that you will be paying for utilities. You'll be paying for electricity. You'll be paying for gas. And that can, particularly now, be a significant cost. So make sure that you factor that into your feasibility before you start. You want to be getting a lot more return from short-term rental than you would long-term rental. I would guesstimate around double for it to be worth your while, okay? So you want to be getting at least double the income from short-term rental to cover all your costs and still be ahead because it's not something that you can do half-heartedly. So as I mentioned, I came to the decision that you are better to have one listing and do it really, really well than have five or ten and just, you know, do it, you know, medi be mediocre. Mediocrity doesn't work on short-term rental. As a result, we are doing a fairly extensive renovation on our Airbnb to really lux it up so that it maintains a high income. We may get more income, but really, um, yeah, it just reduces your va uh, vac vacancy rate and, yeah, just keeps it operating steadily. Another thing to think about is if the property is attached to your own home, that there will be capital gains tax implications. You want to talk to your accountant about that if you do ever sell the property. The other thing that you want to do is to, to make sure that your insurance covers short-term rental. Standard landlord insurance often doesn't, okay? Um, and so you want to make sure that you are adequately adequately insured for um, public liability, for malicious damage and, and so on. And the very last point is you want to be thinking about how you can spoil your guests, okay? So the very easiest way to spoil your guests, and this is going to be like, duh, is to meet them, to actually welcome them into the home. Now, that is not always possible. But I noticed at one stage, I had a few properties on Airbnb and our son, David, had his spare room on Airbnb. And I was doing a much better job of hosting mine than he was of his. And yet his reviews were all amazing. And it was because he built that personal connection with his guest. So that's when I realised that meeting them and, and making that connection is really important. Then in addition to that, what other things can you do for your guest that's going to make them feel really valued and spoiled and looked after? But I think the last point I want to make is that with Airbnb, it's so much fun, okay, because you get to let your creativity run wild. So, you know, with renovating, we've always got to be so careful about, you know, having broad appeal and, you know, being very beige in some ways. Um, whereas Airbnb, you can let your creativity run wild because if it's a bit quirky, it's going to jump out of the page. So that's the first thing. And it's just, a great thing to do. You get to meet lots of people, all of our family Airbnb. Our kids in particular have stayed in amazing places in Paris because they've done a house swap with their Airbnb guests. So there's um, lots of spin-offs from it. And so I really encourage you, if you're not airbnb to consider it. The other great thing about it is you don't actually have to own the home. And so uh, earlier in the year, I interviewed um, the owners of Maggie's in Trentham, which is an amazingly beautiful, um, gracious old house. And that's rented by two men who have, they have set it up as an Airbnb and they create that as an income stream. So it's a really good strategy for someone that doesn't have property but still wants to push up their cash flow 
So really um, think about that. Well, that was a popular topic and I'm very pleased that it was helpful. So take care, everyone. This is the She Renovates podcast. To discover how to harness the power of renovating, check out theschoolofrenovating.com.